Devil Duck Productions. Uh, I solely do sound for film, and Jason uh, does all yeah. kinds of stuff. A little bit of everything. Trying to be the one-man band, but eventually I will spread it out and have a team to help me out. <laughs> well, you, you know a sound guy now. I do know a sound guy. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, today we'll probably talk about just everything from getting sound while you're on set um, and then going all the way straight through to post-production on what you can do to um, clean up the sound in case you know shit happens and you got to clean it up to make sure and save that save that scene and as well as I would love to talk about um, a little bit about sound design because as indie filmmakers we don't necessarily you know have the luxury of going out and capturing these awesome real sounds sometimes so what we do is we go to stock sound and some people think that's good enough but sometimes the stock sound is not good enough so we'll also talk about what you can do to enhance the stock sounds that you can get um, for free to really enhance those moments in your film. Um, why don't we talk about capturing sound on set first? Oh, my, my favorite part because that's probably the that's probably the laziest part of doing anything for film is actually doing the sound for film on set because I mean really quite often it looks like you're just standing there with a boom pole or standing there with a microphone and recording but there's actually quite a few things you have to take into consideration when you're doing location audio for a film set. Uh, first thing I always consider is uh, actually the budget of the film. Because if the film can do ADR, you can do a whole different way of miking stuff that will make it easier for doing ADR as opposed to if, you're, if you know your actors are going to disappear on you and you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, normally having, like how you normally would see somebody with a boom pole way out there over somebody's head, big movies, they have that all the time. All that audio gets thrown out the window. It gets all replaced. So if you're doing an independent film, what I like to do normally is actually know what lens does your cinematographer have? What, what's his focal plane? And I try to keep the microphone along the focal plane, so that way when you're watching the movie, what you're hearing and what you're seeing matches to where you're at. Because if your microphone's 10 feet in front of the, the focal plane of the camera and a car comes by, it's gonna sound totally different 10 feet in front of it than where your actual visual is coming from. And Sometimes it almost makes you sick when you hear it weird like that. It, it, it can mess with your brain and just, you're, it's, it's odd. <laughs> um, just a show of hands, do you guys know what ADR means? No? Uh, ADR is, uh, they call it automatic dialogue replacement. There is not a single thing automatic about it. <laughs> it, is, it is a long, tiresome process of watching the video back and having your actor try to do the same performance on a microphone but in a studio. Uh, probably my favorite video ever on it is a uh, extra scene or a, an extras part from uh, the newest King Kong and it has uh, Jack Black which Lord knows he's always funny and he's there watching it back and he's talking about it and then he just starts cracking jokes like, I think you can hear my shirt. So he just takes off his shirt and then he's standing there, he delivers the line again and he's like shifting his weight. He's like, I think you can hear my shorts. And also you just see him throwing his shorts and <laughs> just, it's, it's all about getting the cleanest dialogue you can. So that way you have that through the film and then everything else gets built behind it. So like you have to build up all the music, you have to, rebuild all the noises that are made so you end up with a whole laundry list of things you have to add because quite often everything recorded on a film set is thrown thrown to the wind and I will second that because as I was editing my film most of the sounds I did um, most of them I did have to throw away um, just because 
some person in the in the dialogue scene decides that he wants to rock his chair a lot, and I keep hearing it, and I was like, ugh. Um, so, um, there are ways to save that, though. Huh? There are ways to save that. There though. are ways to save it, but, but it's money. <laughs> but it's money, and unfortunately, I'm a one-man band, so I have to try to save it myself. However, there are a lot of there are a lot of good things that you shouldn't throw away, um, as far as uh, uh, on-set audio, because um, we're going to get into something called foley. Um, that is usually the sounds of rustling of a shirt. The sound your hand makes when you're make, uh, you know, just all these little subtle things. If they are missing in your film, that's the first thing that your audience is going to catch. Because, you know, if I if I if I pat his shirt and you don't hear it, well, you probably hear the pat, but you don't hear the the texture of the shirt. Something doesn't sound right, um, and that's something you have to really pay attention to when you're when you're doing sound for your film. Is that um, we expect to hear the dialogue because someone's talking. <laughs> if you, if you don't not always the, the case. If but... you don't hear the dialogue, something's wrong. But there might be a guy behind the scene who's working, like uh, you know, with pallets or in the kitchen right now. You know, clank, clank, clank. All that stuff in the background. If you don't pay attention while you're editing, or you're not telling the sound guy, oh, make sure you you know get this guy, or maybe the sound guy missed it. Um, that that's going to throw your entire audience out, and they're just like, oh, yeah, this doesn't sound right. Um, and um, the one thing that I can say right now, uh, I don't think I see anyone from my editing lecture yesterday. One. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, you gain uh, you gain so much from just the audio. Yeah. If I if you close your eyes and um. I set something down, these sounds, if your eyes are closed and you hear me doing these things, your brain automatically says, oh, he's probably, he looks, he sounds like he's brushing something off. He just set his bag down. You automatically visualize it. If you plug your ears and then watch me do it, you know there's a sound there, but you don't have an automatic go-to, oh, that's the sound it's making. Because there's a lot of depth to, you know, these sounds. So. When you're editing your film, do not, do not, do not blow the sound away, because it's gonna, it's gonna take your audience away from your film. Because as soon as they realize there's something missing, they automatically get ejected. Uh, I've noticed with, especially like 1930s movies, I hear the clothes too much. You know, somebody that, walks that's... in wearing a dress and you're, wah, 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 and it's just. A, a big reason for that was because back in that time, the cameras didn't have audio ends on them. So all the stuff was <coughs> made later going along with it. So somebody would be there and they'd, they'd have a leather jacket and they'd be doing that right in front of a microphone directly to analog tape. And the thing is, if it wasn't right, it, you can only use the analog tape so many times before it just gets decimated so they would for budget reasons that's normally why you would have little inconsistencies like that and at the time it was bigger inconsistencies because there wasn't precision monitoring the speakers weren't as good as they are now so things that you anything that you're pulling from old to like our technology now I mean a, a, a good example is uh, uh, Monty Python's Search of the Holy Grail. They now advertise that it's in, it's in amazing hi-fi mono. Because <laughs> they, they, they made a Blu-ray out of it, but it was still a mono recording. So they just resampled it, but it's still all a mono system. <laughs> so it's anything that you pull, you can't, once you're grabbing from older stuff, you can't make it any, you can't pull out anything more than what was originally there uh, without having to physically remake stuff. In the 30s, they didn't have tape. They didn't have analog tape. I think they had some kind of photoelectric device or something like that. Well, they, 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 had, they had vinyl uh, 
but it, those came with vinyl cylinders at the time. So it, not, not the big plates, but there there were cylinders at that time. Same idea, and that's that was even more expensive because I mean, a relative price now you'd be looking about hundred dollars a cylinder, and once you cut one, you can't recut it. So, and back back at the time there, that was maybe five dollars. But <laughs> that relative then, five dollars was quite a bit. Yes, it was. <laughs> Admit it. You're the one who killed him. You seduced him. Gained his confidence. And then when he wasn't looking, you reached into your purse, and without conscience or remorse, you pulled out a gun and shot him. And cut. Curious? Visit theindiegathering.com, a film festival, and so much more. Have you ever wanted to be an actor? At Cleveland Academy of Film Acting, anyone can get on the path to a new exciting film career. If you're new to acting, an experienced pro, or somewhere in between, Cleveland Academy is for you. We help place our students in local film projects. Classes are on Wednesday night from 8 to 10 p.m., and your first class is absolutely free. Call 216-323-2393. That's Cleveland Academy of Film Acting. Welcome to Movie Outline 3, your first step to a successful screenplay. Movie Outline is powerful screenplay development software for both the amateur and the professional screenwriter, which uses the simple technique of step outlining to build your story, characters, and screenplay scene by scene. With Movie Outline, you can easily plan and customize your story structure, color code acts, rearrange scenes, develop and track characters, format your screenplay, and compare your own story to successful Hollywood movies. Movie Outline is the ultimate writer's tool. Whether you're a novice or professional screenwriter, Movie Outline has a host of features to suit your needs, enabling you to plan your story and present your polished screenplay to a professional standard. Don't miss out on the most powerful screenwriting tool available. Visit www.movieoutline.com to download the free demo today. Um, any questions so far as far as... On well, I'm just curious, you seem like really adamant against stock music, or the stock sound effects. Mm -hmm. So is that because... Uh, why is that? I'm not. He might be. <laughs> uh, there's... I'm not adamant. I've, I've used many stock sound effects as starting points. They're normally, if you use a stock sound effect and just throw the stock sound effect in, any trained ear is going to be like, oh, that was the same sound effect in that, and that, and that. I mean, the, the Wilhelm scream. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, 
that's everywhere. The great YouTube video going over the Wilhelm scream over 40 years of film. Because it was just one guy going, ah! And falling. <laughs> and it became a... It, it's almost a, a comedic point now to use it in your film. But I like gunfire sound effects. I mean, you, you're not going to have normal gunfire on a set. But I have recordings of multiple different guns, and that's my, start, my starting point. But you have to EQ it, and you have to maybe give it a little more thud, or if it's a... Uh, if you have a recording of a 45 caliber gun, but the dude's shooting a 22, you actually sh shift a lot of the bass out of it, give it a little more of a high frequency, and it goes from being poof to poof. <laughs> 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 no, the, a big thing with uh, using stock sound effects is actually knowing how to alter them to be what you want. And like what he was saying about keeping all, all that stuff, you don't even, don't just keep it for that particular film. Build your own library. Build what you know that you like, what you think is a sound that you're gonna use often. Because, I mean, I have recordings of myself walking in tennis shoes across carpet, then walking in boots across carpet, and then, I mean, just that alone, and having the mics at different angles, that can save you when if you're shooting on a street and you got all kinds of cars buzzing by and you want to bring out the footsteps, you're going to have to have a whole other set. And it, with, with it, you have to know where the microphone would have been positioned to have the correct, because each footsteps can have a slightly different frequency because some people weigh a little more to one side or as they walk away, the frequencies change because of a Doppler effect. And um, and again, that's I'm I'm not against stock footage, but I but what he said, you have to build onto it. Now, obviously, he he can do all the frequency changes, and I can't because I don't have that knowledge just yet. But um, going with um, my recent my recent film that's about to be released here real soon. Um, <coughs> there's a short there's a short scene where there's a gunfight. And I spent maybe almost close to 15 multi-tracks of different sounds just for her one shot. So the stock sound was, I don't remember which kind of pistol she was shooting, but the shotgun sound sounded pretty good because I think Indiana Jones revolver was actually more of a... Wait, was it, they, used a they used a combination of a shotgun sound effect and the guttural sound of a lion's roar. There you go. Um, <laughs> and, that's, that, and that was a gun sound. Yep, that was them. a gun sound. For me, um, I started with just a regular stock shotgun sound as something to build from. But there's a bunch of other components. So again, you can't just throw the stock sound on there because you have the chamber you know, doing something. You have the trigger being squeezed. You, um, when the person gets hit, Chances are there's probably a sound slightly after that because the bullet travels really damn fast. Yes, so, <laughs> so so I so I put in a little bit of a cracking sound of some celery in there to simulate the skull being hit. Then maybe uh, maybe a little sound because hey, there's blood flying from his head. So all these little sounds in that maybe two frames all built on each other from the stock sound is where you're gonna get something very interesting. Um, because a lot of indie films, or even just things that people throw on YouTube, they, you know, the first thing they love is like, oh, I wanna do, I wanna do, I wanna do a gunfight because those are fun. But, the, but you hear the exact same frequency of that assault rifle every time, top, 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 the whole time. And it just throws you away because you're like, oh. It all it's sounds, not realistic. Yeah, it's not realistic. Um, and it just, I know my first year of gunfight, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it cracks me up with the martial arts movies, because it's always the same sound. The yeah, yeah th there's, there's yes, lots of is. celery cracking. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> what, one thing I actually loved doing for uh, fight scenes in that is... Uh, it's convenient enough that I live by the west, not too far away from the west side market in Cleveland. Uh, I'll actually buy half a pig and hang it. 
in my studio, and I'll be playing playing back the playing back the fight scenes, and I'll be there with two with a, a full size boxing glove on one hand and an MMA glove on the other, and I'll be punching the hell out of this half of a side of pig <laughs> just to get the, the the sounds and all that time because it actually sounds really realistic. And afterwards, I have some very nice tenderized pork chops too. So um, I, I figure I might as well knock a few things out at once. <laughs> um, well, this is actually pretty good. Oh, question. Sorry. Um, is there anything that an actor can do to help with this sound? Um, as in, like, on a set? Just in general, like. Uh, I mean, sometimes if you realize that you're in a really noisy place like uh, uh, restaurants and cafes are notorious for the fact and, and bars are notorious for the fact that they have refrigeration everywhere when that is the case if you can project a little more like you'd be in a theater than than how you would be normally in like a quiet living room that'll save so much so much time at the end for when it comes to post production, uh, some sound some sound people on set will tell you that many won't. Uh, which I don't know why many of the sound people I know are so shy to speak up. Maybe they're afraid that they'll get canned quickly. <laughs> but I feel you'd be more likely to get canned or not get a job again if you don't speak up and allow something to pass. Um, and then I guess office set is understand your speech pattern because I've done ADR before and I'm lucky because I have a musical background so once I heard the way I said it it wasn't that hard for me to match up my own rhythm then you just got to put the emotion into it because um, I had to do an ADR session for mine and you could tell which actors or actresses were really in tune with the way they spoke so they could Re, uh, re, redo it on the spot and then you have the ones that just can't grasp their own timing <laughs> and you're just trying to wonder can I fudge that one take with another take and somehow make it sound like it was one full-on sentence so as an actor or actress definitely also just get in tune with the way you speak because chances are when you're acting it's gonna have the, the slight subtle the same rhythm uh, does anybody here use uh, the Adobe cloud or like the Adobe suite for editing films uh, actually Adobe wants well, audition now it used to be sound booth but Adobe audition now actually has a dialogue alignment software built in on it so if you have to do ADR which I should have told you about that when I saw you had that pulled up <laughs> on, on Facebook but uh, you can actually, you'll have your stock, your original location sound, and it'll analyze it, and it'll analyze what you did for ADR, and it'll line it up. And it, line, it lines it up dead on. Now, it, it doesn't, the, it's a very rudimentary one that it only lines it up. There's better programs out there that not only will line up your dialogue, but if you have a slightly different emphasis on a syllable, It'll actually change it wow. inside. Oh, damn. <laughs> the, that that I bought the program. It's awesome, but it was also two grand. <laughs> so uh, uh, unless you're going to be using it a lot, not really going to pay off for you. Uh, you two have disrupted my classroom for the last time. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Spank us? She can't spank us against the law. Spanking would be too easy. I want to cause more permanent damage. And cut. Curious? Visit theindiegathering.com, a film festival, and so much more.
Welcome to Horror Hotel. Introducing SoundForge Pro Mac, a two-track audio editor reinvented by Mac users for Mac users, redesigned specifically for OS X. SoundForge Pro Mac features an elegantly refined interface. See everything at once, or toggle the view to see only the features you need. Record and edit high-resolution multi-channel audio with speed and precision. Process audio with a wide range of unique and powerful tools. Sony Creative Software now brings its industry-leading expertise and innovative product development philosophy to the Mac. SoundForge Pro Mac enhances your production workflow. It's the ideal complement to any digital audio workstation or non-linear editing environment. Redefining audio editing, SoundForge Pro Mac. Uh, Audition also has a, a noise reduction unit in it. Like if you've got an air conditioning unit that's going on in the background, which is extremely common. Uh, normally I have actors getting sweaty or freezing because they, uh, I'm always turning off the, the HVAC for buildings when we're going to try to get the cleanest audio. Damn it, it's freezing. I was like, go buy a space heater. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, all, all you have to do is, you, if you have even half a second of no noise but just that, you can highlight that and tell that, the, hey, this is the sound that I want removed from everything. And you could normally bring that background noise by about half of what it already is. And take it out and not have too many issues. Now, if you try to push it too hard and take the whole thing out, your voice starts to because it pulls out more frequencies than it should. Yeah, I was just gonna say, sometimes it'll sound like they're underwater. You know, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, I never push it more than six decibels at a time. Uh, a way that if you want to get it even cleaner each time is instead of taking it once, and just slamming it out. If you take it once, you take it. You just take it a little bit, and then it, you highlight the same section again, and then take it a little. And when you do it redundantly like that, it keeps the dialogue better. There's still a limit, though. Uh, there's a Grammy award-winning program out there called Isotope RX. Uh, it has it is safe me so many times uh, I've gotten into the point with it I can take an ambulance out of dialogue uh, it is extremely powerful uh, I mean there's there's a basic version there's an advanced version but they've came out with things like being able to take reverb out of a room so if you're that's my question how do you do that uh, well that pro that program can do that very seamlessly uh, the actual way and the logarithm they used for it was, I, I talked with them for about six months when they were designing it and showing them some things on how I did it. Uh, it takes actually knowing the frequencies that are going in the room and using what's called a, a noise gate, which basically when it, when it gets so low it just shuts off. Well, I did it to a point where it's like, okay, this frequency would bounce around this much, and I'd have only that frequency going through that noise gate, and it would shut that one off, and then it would shut another one off. And you would have so many noise gates going across your whole frequency band to take out what the reverb would be like. And now they have a program finally designed that does it automatically, as opposed to spending 13 some hours to design one for a room when now it just analyzes it. It's like, oh, here you go, boom, and wipes it out. Uh, Sounds expensive, is it? Uh, is it the, nice ba the, the basic one, you're looking at, I, the basic version, they're on RX3 right now, runs you about 200, which uh, that comes with noise cleanup, it comes with uh, 
what's called spectral repair, which is what you can use, like if somebody sneezes in the background, you can take that out. And it analyzes all the audio and keeps the rest of it clean. Uh, uh, it's got the, the, the reverb unit, I believe it's only in the advanced version though, and that's, the advanced version goes like $600. But it's still not horrible. Yeah, it's not horrible, and for given how much it can really save you at times, uh, like a, a big thing they advertise for it is uh, Deadliest Catch. In that show. If you hear the the audio before they used that program on it, you couldn't hear the guys. All you heard was the wind all over the place. They take the wind noise right out. Like it's nothing. It takes it takes thirty seconds to take wind noise out. It was like no, it takes no time, and it gives you a, a better product at the end. Now you got, of course, you have to invest some time in learning it, and learn all the hotkeys and that. But once you do, it's gonna be as fast as any other editing surface you use. Um, take us quite a little step back uh, to what Jordan was saying, recording recording your own sounds and your own libraries of things that you might use. Um, personally, I think that's fun. Oh, and, it's a blast. It, it's a blast. And um, again, it's also very important because, again, those little sounds are the ones that are happening in the background, not in the action. And you'd think the audience would just be focused on the action only of, as far as audio goes, the dialogue and such, but everything in the back is just as important. Um, that being said, um, some of the some of the things that I have personally recorded, uh, shoes, shoes and boots is a is a big one, and especially if it's on carpet, cement, tile, whatever. If you have the time, go out there and just record yourself doing it. If you have time while um, the production is moving to another location and you're still just chilling about, grab some sounds while you're there, because um, every room has its own, every room, every floor has its own uh, tone, if you will, or. Uh, Characteristics. There, there's actually studios in Hollywood that that's all they do is footsteps. Yes. They own. They have like 400 pairs of shoes in there, and they have a a four or a four by four section of gravel, and then concrete, then brick, and the person watches the film and they walk along and then they <laughs> go through and they get the other character and they walk along, and it's, I mean, they spend weeks just walking. <laughs> Sounds fun to me. <laughs> uh, they, they, they get paid for it, and I mean, it's a, it's a big thing. I have a sound person that I work with, this young woman, and she comes in and she'll, you know, we're, we're taking a little break, and I look over, and we were doing an outside shoot, and they had mowed the lawn, and she's over there walking along, recording everything, and going back and forth. And then I, I picked up the headphones, it's like, Oh yeah, again, you know, the squishy sounds. Every time that she goes out someplace and has like, you know, a break for a half an hour, you see her off different places and yeah. doing different things and recording everything, you know? mm -hmm. just because she likes it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, another, another one that I, that I recorded, and I, I looked like a complete idiot when I was doing it, um, your clothes. I, I specifically brought a track jacket, a light jacket, a heavier medium fall jacket to a winter leather jacket. I had this type of linen shirt, cotton shirts, uh, uniformed pants, all these different things. And all I did was in front of the microphone, I would just go wave, wave, wave. Or maybe it's a more aggressive motion, so then I would like twirl a little bit. Or because I'm doing action, more, more action films, chances are someone's gonna grab you. So I would just sit there and just grab at all these cl different cloths. Um, and the cool thing about having these clothes sounds is you can use them for a whole lot of different things. Yeah, um, Just my arm movement, if you want to accentuate that arm movement, just having that extra fabric sound is great. Um, if someone's falling to the floor, it actually sounds pretty close to grabbing a leather jacket. Um, even though Squirrel. 
Um, <laughs> even, even though if you record something that was meant for a specific purpose, this is where we'll probably segue into how you can get creative with your sounds. Even though you recorded it being a specific motion, like, oh, I fell to the ground, oh, I'm grabbing this, you can actually transfer those into something completely different. Again, whacking celery <laughs> is, is your skull breaking or something like that. Um, there's broken a, arm. Or broken arm. Yeah. Um, just re basically just recording clothes is probably the first thing I would do if you have the time um, to have in your own personal library just because there's so many things that revolve around your clothes moving in a, in a, in a, in a film. Good one. Oh, go on. Say, when you guys are sampling this stuff uh, yourselves and putting them in your library, what are you recording with? Just out of curiosity. He's got a lot more mics than I do. I just have a cheap shotgun mic. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. A shotgun mic going into just a, um, my Tascam audio recorder with an XLR input. Yes. When you record, when you record on tape or a card or what? Uh, I'm normally recording straight to a hard drive. I use a, I use a sound devices recorder quite often. Uh, if I'm just out in a belt and I hear something like, oh, I normally have an H4N on me. I mean, an H4N costs, I, I think they're costing only like $130 at Best Buy right now.